Some of you are out of place from the last few weeks. Did you watch the Sunday that uh, Tim put up there right quick? The pictures that they had printed and set up at the house? With, you know what I'm talking about? If, if you don't know, they're out in the truck. I'll show you. After a while. <laughs> that was really a great idea. I don't know who thought that up, but have I, have I mentioned yet? It's good to see you. <laughs> I don't want that to, to slip past us. God, Jesus, we're uh, continuing in this little series. Jesus is the greatest friend that we're ever going to find in the message this morning. He is a friend of the desperate. Hmm. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke 8. We're going to be looking at verse a great story. <laughs> Some have called this the miracle on the way to a miracle. Luke 8, verses 40 to 56. Let me, let me start off asking this question. Have you ever felt desperate? I mean, really. Really desperate. Down to your very last hope. You've tried everything. Kind of a desperate story this morning, Jesus has an encounter with a couple of individuals that are just absolutely at the end of their ropes. Stories are very different, but they're desperate. And uh, took a miraculous step of faith to come to the one who is a friend of the desperate. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll jump into this. Father, it's so good to be here. Thank you for letting us come back together as family. And Lord, I know some of our group are still a little cautious, and that's okay. We have some not feeling too well today, and we ask that you uh, encourage them and comfort them and strengthen them and heal them. Father, perhaps there's some that uh, didn't get the message that we were coming back today, but we miss seeing them and Again, we give you thanks and praise that we get to see each other here this morning. Father, there's a great story. And I pray that you would speak to us deep to deep this morning. That we can see ourselves in the story. And that we can learn from it uh, in those times that we need to make that desperate reach of faith. As we talked about a while ago, you're the only one we can look to. And you're more than enough. You're all we need. Our fullness, our completeness, our wholeness, our wellness is found in you. Speak to us this morning, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Listen to this journal entry from a famous historical person. And, and as we read this, see if you can relate uh, to this any. Okay? says, I'm now living, no, let me start again. I'm now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human race, there would not be one cheerful face on the earth. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better. What do you think about that? That's pretty heavy, isn't it? That's pretty, and this is, a, this is a very famous historical person. I'm the most miserable man living. And if for what I were feeling, the weight that's upon me, the pressure, the stress, if it were distributed throughout the whole earth, there would not be one smiling face anywhere. I must die or be better. Who was that? Who, who said that? Winston Churchill. That's a good guess. Pretty close. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. In the middle of the Civil War, he penned those words in his journal. And we all go through times of depression. 
desperation, searching for hope, don't we? And that's our Bible study this morning. It's also recorded in Matthew 9 and Mark 5. I'll touch and do a little bit of comparison as we go through. Now, the last time that I was talking on this subject about Jesus being the best friend we'll ever find, mm -hmm. he had uh, healed a man in the region of the Gerasenes. Do you remember what that guy's problem was? Uh, he, he was... Uh, Tied up, bound in chains, lived among the tombs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he was demon-possessed, and Jesus cleared all that up. Well, this story follows that story. Okay, we put Mother's Day in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is following his visit to the Gerasenes, mm -hmm. uh, the region of the Gerasenes there. And... Uh, Let's just, let's just read this, okay? Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. And a man named Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. How old is Abby? 11. 11. Okay, so kind of get the visual on that he's eleven. She will be in. Okay, so okay. So as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. Have you ever been <laughs> they were not practicing social distancing? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever been where you felt like a sardine? I remember um, gosh, a number of years ago, uh, went to uh, I think it's Owen Field in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, OU Sooners were playing the Nebraska, what's the name of that little team? Yeah, the, the Cornhuskers. Uh, and, and I mean, this was a major, major bowl game. And it was pouring down rain, the whole thing. I mean, and it was so close and so good. It was such a great game. And nobody wanted to leave early. But when the game was over, everybody wanted to leave at the same time. And so we all got up out of the bleachers and then went down and, and stood in this little corridor. hallway, corridor. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> and, and, and right here, we're not getting rained on. Now they are. <laughs> and the ones that are trying to flee and run to their cars. But uh, several people just decided, you know, let's, let's just hang out for a minute. <laughs> And, and a minute grew and stretched out. And all those people are getting wet. They don't want to get wet. So they're, they're coming in. And one of my buddies that was with me, I said, my knee itches. Would you scratch it for me? And he's like, what? And I said, well, you're closer to it than I am. Just, you know, I mean, we were, we were packed. I like to think about stuff as I get into stories. Mm -hmm. To think about this tight crowd because as you get in the Greek language, it's very, it's very clear. Were they just bumping into each other? No, the Greek says that they almost crushed him. That's pretty tightly packed. Mighty girl. And a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for twelve years. That's important. Keep that in mind. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Pretty cool. Who touched me? Jesus asked. And when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, it, depending on your version, the people are crowding or pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. And then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. And in the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And this is one of the most beautiful verses in Scripture. Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith 
has healed you. Go in peace. Isn't that awesome? Well, while Jesus is still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. But on hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. And when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he didn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James. That was his clique. We read about other times, Peter, James, and John, I mean, they were, they were tied. It's okay to have, what is it, BFFs? Mm -hmm. Best friends forever, whatever. It's only those three and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people are wailing and mourning for him. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him because they knew she was dead. And he took her by the hand and he said, My child, get up. And maybe your version has, or one of the other uh, gospels says, Talitha kum. My child, arise. The little girl, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. And everybody went. Yeah. Okay. Jesus told them to give her something to eat. The parents were astonished that he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. What we have in this story, we've got a broken-hearted dad, and we have a hopelessly sad woman. Mark 5.23 tells us that Jairus pleaded earnestly with him. That would be one of those <clears throat> when somebody says, we, re we have prayer requests and we really need to pray hard about this. Okay? Have you ever prayed hard? Oh God! Well, I mean, he was he was desperate. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little girl is dying. Did you catch how old she was? Twelve. Twelve. His little daughter was twelve, and we can relate. You know, it doesn't matter how old your little girl gets. She's still your little girl. Right, Carol? Yep. Mm -hmm. Carol's got a little girl right there right here this morning. Just had a birthday last week or so. 16. 16 again, okay. For the 24th time. Well, hey. Congratulations. Doesn't matter how old or how big our kids get, they're still our little boy and our little girl. My little boy's 6'3 and he's 260 pounds. He's still my little boy. And unfortunately, some of us have experienced the pain and the desperate plea of having a very sick child, or one that has suffered a bad injury, or perhaps even death. We, some of us, knows what it feels like. Again, Carol, to lose a child, because we're not supposed to bury our children, and so we can relate just how this broken-hearted dad is feeling. We understand the desperate plea for help and hope. So we've got this broken-hearted dad, and in the midst of this crowd, there's this hopelessly sad woman. You catch what her problem is. She has a chronic menstrual disorder, perpetual issue of blood, and that kind of condition would be very difficult for any woman of any era in any culture but especially for a Jewish woman in that day, nothing could have been worse. That was just, that was just tough. That was bad stuff. Put that up here. I missed that. There it is. Check this out. No part of her life was unaffected. Sexually, she couldn't touch her husband if she were married. Maternally, well, she couldn't bear any children. Domestically, anything she touched within the home became unclean. 
In fact, hitting the pause button here, remember we've said before the Pharisees, they're the guys that weren't fair, you see? They had taken the basic commandments and laws and expanded them and gone nuts with them, like we've got stuff going nuts today. And they even said, if a woman during her cycle passes by and her shadow crosses something, whatever her shadow crosses becomes unclean. Seriously? Mm -hmm. You talk about your social distancing. Mm -hmm. And so imagine here's here's a lady outside and she's trying to 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 put together some some flour for her family and she's kneading the dough and whatever and here comes somebody down the street. She goes, cross the street before you get over here. Because if her shadow passed, that's un you can't do that. Isn't that crazy? Crazy, crazy? crazy. Well, spiritually, she's not allowed to enter the temple courts. She is physically exhausted, socially ostracized, her heart's broken, her dreams are shattered. This is a hopelessly sad woman. And others pen these words. Spring is past, summer's gone, winter's here. And my song that was meant to be sung still isn't sung. I've spent my days stringing and unstringing my instrument. And some of us can relate to that. Some of the things that we wanted to get done here in recent weeks, I haven't been able to do it. And we're frustrated and we're tired, and we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and we want this to end. Well, Mark tells us that she had suffered a great deal from many doctors through the years. Do you remember how long she'd been dealing with this? Twelve years. Twelve years and twelve years. And I think it's just interesting. I don't know that there's any real reason to this, but to me, I think it's interesting that Luke doesn't mention some of the specifics about this. He was a doctor. Bingo. Yeah. He was a doctor. In our wildest speculation, do you think it's just possible? Do you think there's a chance? Do you think it's maybe probable that Dr. Luke himself might have tried to okay. help him? I don't know. Doesn't matter, certainly not. A part of our salvation, however we believe about that. But it's just interesting to think about. And some of us can relate with this woman. We've suffered from different doctors and medical bills and tests and treatments and emotional roller coasters of what's going on. I'm so thankful Foster and Linda here this morning. Linda does not feel well at all. She's been in and out of the hospital. She doesn't feel good this morning, but she said, I, I needed to be here. I don't feel like being here, but I, I needed to be here. Some of us have been sick and tired of being sick and tired before. And you go to this doctor and that doctor and this and that, and you're like, come on now. Understand, every day this woman woke up in a body that nobody wanted. That's pretty heavy. She's tried it all. She's now down to her last desperate reach, desperate reach for hope. We've got this broken-hearted dad over here, this hopelessly sad woman. One's losing the joy of his life for the past 12 years. The other has been carrying around 12 years of living hell. But they, together they have a crazy hunch and a high hope that something good's going to happen. And, it, and some of us know if hope's gone, there's not much left. Because that little light is that little light of hope. Hope wasn't dead with these two, not yet at least. They both had this crazy hunch that Jesus could do something, and I hope that he would, so they approached him through the crowd, and according to Mark's account of the story, this woman's kind of thinking to herself, you know, if I can just push my way through this crowd, if I can just push my way through, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, that I believe that would be enough. If I, you know, I don't want to talk to him, I don't want to disturb him, I don't want to interrupt him. If I could, if I could just touch him. 
<laughs> and she did. And Jesus says, who touched me? Now I imagine the disciples are looking at each other in bewilderment. And probably thinking, who hasn't touched you, Lord? And it's interesting, Jesus goes, who touched me? And nobody's, I mean, everybody that's trying to get up their clothes, everybody starts backing off now. You ever been in an elevator and start to cough? <laughs> to take, we're just full confession this morning. Interviewed for ministry a <laughs> number of years ago. And uh, the guy and his wife that were showing us around and whatnot, we... Uh, Went to San Antonio when we went up in the needle, whatever that's called, okay? Uh, observation tower. And we get in this little elevator, and there's all kinds of people in this elevator. And we get up there. Well, I begin to find out that this guy has is just paranoid of all kinds of stuff. I mean, he's, he's kind of like a Howie Mandel with stuff. He's afraid of heights. He's afraid of noise. He's afraid of germs and whatever. And so I decided... <laughs> well, if this is a chance to get acquainted, you might as well know what you're getting into. Okay. So I convinced him, you need to come out here on the outside and walk around and look. Uh-oh. <laughs> Finally got him out there, and then I'm like, I wonder how solid this is. And I started jumping up and down, and I think he left his fingerprints or, or marks in the concrete wall, you know. And he was like, I can't believe you. He is so mean. You know, and I'm like, hey, buddy, life's too short not to tease and play a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so then when we got on the elevator to come back down, and it was <laughs> coming down because it was dark, and they were, they were letting people know, we're going to be closed in, you need to go down. And so we get on the elevator, we're just all in here, and I'm facing him. And I said... Did the doctor say your cough's contagious? And when somebody says that to you, there's just something about you that goes... <laughs> he couldn't not cough. And it was interesting, even though we're in a packed elevator, people that scooted back away from him. <laughs> when we got down, he hit me. <laughs> We became real good friends, but we're getting to know each other. Jesus says, who touched me? I see everybody moving back. Because nobody would admit to touching him. Mm -hmm. The disciples are saying, Lord, who hadn't touched you? Who hasn't? It's like a mosh pit in here. People are crying. Lord, everybody in here wants a piece of you. But the Bible says Jesus knew what? What happened? Power had gone out from him. Isn't that wild to think about that? Power had gone out. And it's not that he didn't know who did it. I mean, he's God. He knew who did it. He wanted this lady to step forward and identify herself. He wanted her to know that it was her faith, not the hem of his garment. He wanted to affirm her faith and her worth in the sight of these people. He wanted her to know that... She was never going to be overlooked again in her life. All Jewish men, any man that would touch her or whatever would be considered defiled. So therefore, all men were avoiding her, avoided touching her, avoided looking at her, speaking to her. And she pushed through the crowd anyway and touched them all. She did. And how long has this been going on? Twelve years. Now we've missed each other for a few weeks. Forever. She's gone twelve years being avoided. I mean, people knew who she was. And in a way that only Jesus could do it. He wanted everybody to know that some big time touching is getting ready to happen here. He wants everybody to know that this hopelessly sad woman is never to be overlooked again. And in a way that only Jesus could do, he 
He says, daughter. And I want you to know, this is the only time that Jesus ever spoke that word to a woman. Never ever again do we see that. What a term of endearment. Now we use some of those around here. This, I mean, we just do that all the time. All the gals, sweetie, or whatever, and the guys, hey, buddy, whatever. I mean, we, 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 we just do that. That's, that's kind of a southern thing. Uh, Tim's uh, sister-in-law up in Kansas <laughs> communicated emails. She said, boy, one of the things I don't like is when people call me hun. I'm not your hun. And so I'll send an email. Love you, hun. You know, just to do the chalkboard <laughs> thing, you know. Um, Tiffany at the bank doesn't like to be called hun, okay? And sweet people come in, make a deposit. Oh, thank you, hun. You know, it's, you're welcome. With the hair on her neck, just standing up. So I call her hun. You know, just to be friendly and have fun. He calls her daughter. What's up with that? Can you imagine how that made her feel? What a term of a demon. What, when was the last time anybody had ever shared any kind of affection with her? When's the last time any guy had ever looked her straight in the eye? When's the last time she had ever received an embrace from anyone, let alone a man? How long had it been since there had been a, a gentle hug or a peck on the cheek? Here's the Son of God reaching down, saying, Daughter. Your faith is what healed you. Now go in peace. And that word peace, that's a big word. It's a big word. It's kind of like when Jesus calmed the storm. said, peace be still. And the wind stopped and the wave stopped. Same word. He tells her body, peace. Linda would like to hear that word right now. Peace. Oh, this is good stuff. Well, in the midst of all this stuff, Jairus' daughter's passed away, and somebody from the house who assumes it's too late for Jesus to do anything suggests, don't, don't bother the teacher anymore. It's no use now. She's, she's passed away. She's gone. It's over. But when you look at verse 50, again, another powerful word. Jesus says, don't be afraid, just trust me. It's going to be alright. Don't limit your faith, don't limit my compassion, don't limit God's power. And when they reach the house, he only allows his little clique to go in with him. Jesus, James, John, Peter, mom and dad. And he says, she's only asleep, but somebody overhears that. And we talked before, you know, that quite often with the passing of somebody, they would hire professional mourners. Mm -hmm. Well, this is Jairus. Who's Jairus? Big wig at the temple. He's the big wig at the temple. And so we can imagine professional mourners being brought in. And here's all this commotion and all this. Have you, have you ever been around somebody that's wailing at a funeral? I mean, wailing? I have. That's, that'll set you back. And Jesus is like, get off it. Stop. Quit all this drama. I wonder if that's in the Amplified Version. Yeah. Kill the drama! <laughs> She's just asleep. Well, they, they knew she was dead. But he goes in and he says, My child, get up. Her spirit returned. She got up. And the parents are just blown away. Why did Jesus say, uh, Don't tell anybody what's going on? You guess? Because of his position in the temple? The Jairus' position in the temple? That's a good guess. 
He didn't want people coming to him just for that. He was seen by people. Okay. Yeah. Jesus' main purpose was not to come be a healer. That's, I mean, he did that, but that's not why he came. His main reason for coming was not physical healing, but his ministry was to bring the very words of eternal life. He spoke words to bring her back to life. But we understand, I mean, it goes without saying, but one day this daughter did pass away. I mean, have you seen that? in the news anywhere. Jairus' daughter is wearing a, a mask and is, you know, she's not still with us. So his, his thing was not so much the physical healing, but to bring the words of eternal life. Okay. Let's get to the message. You ready? Three things I want to share with you. <laughs> right quick. They're like, ah, is he serious? Yeah, just three things right quick. When it comes to making our own reach of desperation, number one, when you're making a reach of desperation, fight through the crowd. And I don't necessarily mean packed in like sardines. Let me explain this. In other words, don't listen to the doubters in the crowd because there are going to be voices around us who are going to try to dissuade us by saying it's no use. You ever been in that group? You got those little voices saying, nah, this is hopeless. You got to fight through that crowd. Church, it's imperative that we've got a few people in our lives who are going to encourage us along in our faith journey. And I think that's what Kimberly was talking about a while ago. That's here. That's where she feels. That's where, that's where she comes to get her, her charge in is when the body of Christ ministers and says, and, and she's been busy doing that for the last however many weeks. She's been going around taking care of other people. But that's just who she is. Maybe you heard about the lady that uh, received a, an encouraging letter from a friend. And uh, as she opens it up, a $20 bill falls out. And there's this little note that says, I put this in here, treat yourself to a meal, whatever. And it's just a great little letter of encouragement. And she's like, Lord, I've been so blessed. Uh, you've just been so good to me, and, and I'm so thankful. And she's looking out her window, second story apartment. She sees this little man sitting down here, shabbily dressed, and she's thinking, you know, I wonder if he has anybody that encourages him. Lord, you've just blessed me so much. I've got friends, I've got family, people that love me and care for me, encourage me. I bet this little fella could use some encouragement himself. So she gets an envelope. And puts the $20 bill in the envelope, seals it, and writes, Don't despair on the front of the envelope. She goes over to her window and drops it, and it kind of... And just lands right down in his lap. And she was like, Thank you, Lord. I feel so much better to be able to give and to share and to do something like that. Well, later that evening, there was a knock at the door. and She opened it up, and here stood the little shabbily dressed man. And he's got a wad of money in his hand. And she says, what, what can I do for you? And he said, lady, this is yours. And she says, what do you mean? And he said, I got your message, don't despair. 130 to 1 over at Ritama this afternoon. This is, this is, it was a horse race. It was a bet. <laughs> Kurt's out there laughing a couple of years looking at me like, <laughs> Well, maybe some of us do have some well-meaning people that will drop us a line of encouragement from time to time, <laughs> saying, don't despair. I spent uh, two or three days with my middle son, Jeremy, uh, this week over at my mom's. Uh, mom's health is, is not good, and there's same things that have to be done, need to be done, and uh, he's not working because everything with his business is either school-related or sports-related. So, to get him off the couch, I said, come help me. But I just share this because I was really proud. Because as we're doing all of our stuff, and we're going to run, get lunch, and this, and that, and whatever, he's calling some of his buddies, his, what he calls his fur 
fraternity brothers. <laughs> okay. Calls some of his fraternity brothers, and he he call up and he say, "Hey, bud, how you doing? Just checking in. How are you? How are things going? Because all of them are in the same same boat. Okay, how's it going? I just want to check on you. I want to encourage you to keep the chin up. It's gonna be all right. We're gonna get through this." And some of his fraternity brothers are believers, and so they can talk about that. But the others that aren't, he's tossing that in there. Mm -hmm. Well, the Lord's been faithful to take care of us. And I thought, how cool, son. How cool that you're doing that. You're being a Barnabas. There was this guy named Saul that was persecuting Christians like crazy. He has this blinding light. God says, or Jesus said, I'm going I'm to make you one of my... Uh, apostles mm -hmm. and I'm going to hook you up with a fellow named Barnabas that's going to teach you and through all of that he changes his name to Paul and you know the rest of the story Barnabas the name means son of encouragement mm -hmm. Jeremy's just calling and encouraging people mm -hmm. Kimberly's been doing that I've got guys that will send me jokes or little pictures or little cartoons or whatever that just that's a Barnabas ministry it's just how you doing how you doing? Keep your chin up. we got to have people like that because the majority of people are going to say it's no use. Why are you praying about this? God doesn't care. Prayer doesn't work. There's always going to be people in our lives who speak can't, who live won't, and who believe it's just not possible. And so let me ask you right now, who is it in your life that speaks and acts and talks like because if you've got those negative Nellies in your life, love them and keep them at distance. And I'm not talking social distancing. I'm talking the distance from your mind and your heart. Don't listen to that stuff. It's hard to do when it's in your face. It's very hard to do when it's in your face. It's hard to do when it's family. It's hard to do when it's an employer. And this woman might have been told some things like that. You can't possibly get through this crowd. Who do you think you are? You know who you are. It's not going to be possible for you to get to Jesus. He's too holy for anybody like you. He's not going to want to be bothered by you, let alone be touched by you. You're hopeless. You're not going to get any better, won't you? Just... You wonder how she had to hide herself because, I mean... She was ostracized, basically. Mm -hmm. How did she get through the crowd to begin with to mm -hmm. even get mm -hmm. to that? Because everybody knows everybody, mm -hmm. and they knew she was ostracized. <coughs> so it was a miracle in itself for her to even get through the crowd to touch his garment because of their belief system. In, in my mind's eye... I see her hunched down as low as she could, mm -hmm. covered up, maybe just looking at feet mm -hmm. and moving her way and just look. Because what did she touch on Jesus? His hem the hem of his garment. The hem of his garment. Where is that? Down the bottom. It's not bottom. She can go up and tap him on the shoulder. And I could see her possibly even just lunging forward. There it is. So she probably got an earful of all this chin music. Jairus probably heard stuff like, you know, Jesus is a busy man. He's not going to come all the way over to your house. In fact, do you even know who this is? This is the teacher that's been roasting all the religious leaders around here. And you're the head of the synagogue. Man, if he opens up on you, you're not going to get any help from this rabbi. And besides, your, your daughter's already dead. Just, But they fought through the crowd. Who touched me? <clears throat> and I love how the Bible says that the woman could not go unnoticed. We can't go unnoticed in the presence of Jesus. He knows the person that's reaching out in faith. He can always distinguish between the jostling of the crowd and a desperate tug of faith. Isn't that good? 
When we reach through the crowd, He gives our needs priority like nobody else matters. So don't believe the lie that there's no hope. Amen. So you've got to reach, push through the crowd. Secondly, when we get humble and we cry out and help in a humble on our knees kind of desperation, God hears us and lifts us up. Now this synagogue is a local center of worship. The ruler is responsible for the administration, building maintenance, worship, supervision, all those things. It's kind of like the head deacon or the head honcho or whatever you would call him. And it would really be very unusual for someone in his position to humble himself and go to an itinerant preacher, especially that so many negative things are being said about him. But he was humble enough, even in his high position, to express his desperation. And in contrast, Jairus is a well-liked, high-position, spiritual figure, surrounded by friends, kind of a guy. But he overcame his pride, he humbled himself, and he fell at the feet of Jesus. This woman, by contrast, was an outcast. She was unclean, overlooked, alone, poor, rejected. But she too boldly overcame her shame to approach him. Both of these people on opposite ends of a social spectrum, both of them fell at his feet and said, I need your help. Humility is basically saying, God, I'm losing it here. I, I can't do this. I need help. James says, if you humble yourself before God, He will lift you up. Old song, maybe you remember it. Maybe you learned it years ago. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And He will lift you up higher and higher. And He will lift you up. And then you would do that in rounds. And you'd be at a campfire and you'd be crying because it's so beautiful. Oh, yes, Lord, you will. This is truth. We've got to realize our need for His touch. We've got to humble ourselves at the feet of Jesus. And, and some of us have already done this, but I know that there's others that still need to bow before the feet of Jesus and say, I need your help. And I just want to say this. Healing begins from the kneeling position. One of the most powerful things we can do in our faith journey is get on our knees before the Father. and just surrenders. I can't do it. Get on our knees and admit, I'm powerless. Healing begins when we get on our knees, when we reach through the crowd, when we take a step, when we cry out, when we surrender, we apologize, we release a grudge, we write a letter, we ask for forgiveness, we confess a sin, we make a phone call, we visit the doctor, go to AA, whatever it takes. But we got to do something. And it starts in our broken desperation on our knees at the feet of Jesus. And my friends, God honors that. Third thing right quick. Almost done. we got to reach out in faith. Like God, like Tina was talking a while ago. And, and we were talking in here. But you got faith or fear. And there are some people that are just afraid. Afraid to trust God. I can't see. How do you trust somebody you can't see? Well, I would just share this encouraging word, and I bet most of you believe with this. We can't see God either. But we have seen Him at work in our lives. And we know He's real. And we know it's true. And it really happens. And sometimes we're afraid because we've been burned in life. And if you're afraid to trust somebody, I want to assure you, God knows your name. He wants to look in your eyes. He wants to call you daughter. He wants to call you son if you'll reach out in faith. The Hebrew writer says faith is being sure of, grabbing a hold of what we hope for, and being a certain of what we don't see. Ever watch the guys on the trapeze thing, you know? And they're just going back and forth. And back and forth, and as long as they're strong enough to hold on to that thing, 
Now, Chunky Preacher would probably take off and go, you know, and so have lots of nets and mattresses under there. But these strong people, and, and they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And as they're going back and forth, there's somebody over there that at just the right time sends another one. And here's this, this empty thing going back and forth over here. Well, what's this guy on this side supposed to do? His, his goal is to grab that one. You can't grab that one unless you let go of this one. They're spaced apart just enough you can't do that. And if you could, that'd be a mess, wouldn't it? <laughs> Faith is grabbing the hold of what we hope for. I hope to grab that thing. And verse 6 says, without faith, we can't please the Father. It's a conviction that we can and a hope that we will. It's not a belief that God's going to do what we want. It's the assurance that He's going to do what's best. Because God sees the big picture. He knows the eternal perspective on things. He will respond to our desperate reach of faith. And church, you don't need me to tell you that we're facing unprecedented times. Days of desperation. For those who reject the demands of an out-of-control government and who stand only for the morals and principles of the Lord Jesus Christ has found His Word, those days are quickly approaching and soon to be upon us. Amen. Some of us have realized through recent weeks this whole charade of a virus isn't about a virus. About a whole lot more. And so I, I want to encourage all of us in those moments that we begin to feel even the least bit desperate. We've got to hold on to Jesus. We've got to have our eyes focused on Him. Certainly not on a preacher. Not on a president or a government or an employer. Or on the mighty dollar. Amen. As has been said, all of our little G gods have been taken away from us. It's a good chance for us to wake up and smell the coffee and realize the only thing that really matters is the big G God. Mm -hmm. And He's there waiting just to take care of us. All the time. Fight through the crowd. Humbly fall into His feet. And reach out in faith. He's the greatest friend we'll ever know. And some of us have already discovered and others will more than likely discover one of these days that he is a friend of the desperate. I've had situations in my life that I have I've had nothing else but the Lord just I've told you when my little girl was dying and I went down the chapel at the hospital and just put my face in the carpet and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit interprets our prayers for us. Because what do you say? Stuff that uh, the Carlsons are dealing with now with the grandkids. What do you say? You, you, you said anything logical that could be said, but there's, they're, they're in a tremendous spiritual battle against evil. It's desperate. A desperate reach of faith. God's there. He's in control. Some of us have gone through horrible divorces. Or like God. Some of us have lost spouses or children or best friends or siblings. And we felt desperate. A number of years ago, all that I went through over that stupid cat thing I just sat in a chair. I didn't have a track for my brain to go do anything. I just, I just sit there crying, saying, "God, I don't get it." And I've shared this with you before, that the morning of my last court date, 
where they were going to slap me on the back of the hand and say, you need to go do community service. My attorney goes, do you know who this man is? This is what anyway, my devotional that morning said, God owes you no explanation. I was like, well, great, this is going to be a good day. <laughs> but he doesn't. He doesn't know us any explanation of anything. Instead, he just says, trust me. Hmm? Goliath is pretty big. Goliath is pretty darn big. But David only sent one rock. Guys, I don't know what all the future is going to hold for us. We need to pray for each other all the time. All the time, all the time, all the time. The chances of being able to come and visit. Who knows what somebody's going to decide about. The faces, or the, the, the chances of meeting together corporately. They, they tried to stop it, but your, your leadership said, we haven't been given the green light yet, but we're coming back here. Because that's what's best for Riverside. But our God knows. I've got numerous books on Revelation, and no matter whoever you read, you're going to get a different opinion. We've all got to know it's a little bit different. And there's different ideas on stuff, but we just got to hold on. Just got to hold on. And as Jimmy said a while ago, it's time to stand up. So I encourage you as together, though separately, we may be taking our stand for Jesus. Let's pray. God, I thank you for who you are. And I thank you for who you allow us to be as your children. Bless us as we reach out in faith. Hear our prayers. Know our desperation. Comfort our weary and troubled hearts with the assurance that You are God and You're large and in charge. Nothing's taken You by surprise. And we'll confess to You, there's some times, Lord, we don't understand why You let situations go as far as they do. but you've told us in your word to quit trying to figure it out and just trust you. You've said that we should not lean on our own understanding and that's wise counsel because we don't understand. You just said, just trust me, trust me, trust me. And that's what Jesus said to Jairus. Just trust me. And what a miracle. We seek those same things in our lives if it's your will. Be God, do your thing. We'll give you our thanks and praise in Jesus' name.